it is now my pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague and now fearless leader um, who, will be, who will be giving a talk this evening. Dr. Thomas DiLorenzo is the president of the Mises Institute. He holds a PhD in economics from the Virginia Polytechnic Institute, now Virginia Tech, um, and was a university economics professor for 41 years. Oh, four years. He's not that old. <laughs> with faculty positions at Loyola University, Maryland, George Mason University, University of Tennessee at Chattanooga, Washington University in St. Louis, and State University of New York at Buffalo. Dr. DiLorenzo is the author or co-author of 18 books, including The Real Lincoln, Hamilton's Curse, How Capitalism Saved America, uh, and the, politically in the Problem with Socialism, and The Politically Incorrect Guide to Economics. He's also widely published in the academic literature, including the American Economic Review, Economic Inquiry, Southern Economic Journal, Public Choice, International Review of Law and Economics, the Review of Austrian Economics, the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics, and many others. He has appeared on hundreds of radio talk shows, including the Rush Limbaugh Show, after which his book, The Real Lincoln, shot up to number two in sales um, in, on Amazon.com. Um, so I will... I give you Dr. Thomas DiLorenzo, the greatest living opponent um, and enemy of Lincoln lovers everywhere, um, um, who will speak to us on the axis of evil, America's three worst presidents. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you all for coming. You can have a great week. Try to pace yourself a little bit if that's possible. And uh, every year, some students tell us this was the best week of their year as far as school goes. And uh, I'm betting that a lot of you will think that also when, when you come uh, by the end of the week. And so uh, what I'm going to talk about is um, America's three worst presidents, in, in, in my opinion. And before I do that, though, uh, one of the things I hope you'll learn uh, here this week is that uh, Austrian economics and libertarian philosophy provide a, a very powerful lens through which to study history. Uh, as Mises said in uh, Human Action, uh, you know, history has to be interpreted. The facts are just facts. That's why so many history books are excruciatingly boring. And they're all interpreted. Everybody who writes a book on some historical topic uh, interprets the facts in certain ways. And uh, if you ha understand economics, Austrian school free market, Austrian school economics, and are attuned to uh, the philosophy of freedom, you, look, you can look at these same facts in a very different way than somebody who is uneducated in, 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 those, in those areas. And so uh, uh, with that said, that's, that's sort of what has informed me in my study of these things. Now, as far as the three worst uh, presidents go, I'm going to talk about Lincoln, Woodrow Wilson, and FDR. Uh, if, if you look at the, uh, the American academic history profession, uh, periodically publishes the rankings of the best, the greatest presidents, and uh, Lincoln and FDR are always there at the top. And Woodrow Wilson used to be at the top, near the top, until they discovered about three or four years ago that he resegregated the US military. And so they took his statue down at Princeton. He was a political science professor at Princeton and also the president of Princeton before he became president. And so uh, I don't know if they burned him in effigy or not at Princeton or, or whatever, but he's no longer near, uh, near the top, but he's still one of the worst all, all time. Okay, and so, so why do I think that? Well, I guess I'll start with, I'll go chronological order. I'll start with Lincoln. Uh, all Americans are taught in elementary school, if not sooner, that Lincoln saved the Union. The truth is he destroyed the American Union. The American Union was a voluntary union of the Founding Fathers. Uh, a number of states, when they ratified the Constitution, reserve the right to reassume the powers that they had delegated to the federal government. And it was assumed that all the states had, had that power. And that was a, another way of saying secession was legal. It was a voluntary union. It wasn't like the Soviet Union held together with tanks and mass murder. It, it was a voluntary union. And everyone understood that. 
Uh, New York was one of the states that said this in their ratification document. Rhode Island said the same thing yeah, there. And so the, but the Union was no longer uh, voluntary after the American Civil War, which I like to call the War to Prevent Southern Independence. Okay, it, was, it, was all, it was literally held together by force, invasion, uh, mass murder. You know, uh, as Murray Rothbard said, uh, uh, the state uses the word war for mass murder, but it's the same, it's the same thing, isn't it? Now, as far as the cause of the war, um, one of the things you're probably, if you're an American, you probably never taught this in school, but in July of 1861, the, uh, the U.S. Congress issued a war aims resolution declaring to the world what the purpose of the war was. And it was called the Crittenden-Johnson Resolution. And here's one part of it, what they said. So this war, I'm quoting from it, this war is not waged upon our part in any spirit of oppression. That was a lie. <laughs> um, nor for any purpose of conquest or subjugation. That was a bigger lie. Subjugation? Uh, okay. Nor, here's the key part, nor purpose of overthrowing or interfering with the rights or established institutions of those states by which they meant slavery. So they announced the world to the world that this war has nothing to do with slavery. This is the US Congress, the House and the Senate, joint resolution, but to defend and maintain the supremacy of the Constitution and to preserve the Union. And they meant preserving the Union geographically. They didn't mean uh, preserving the Union philosophically as a voluntary Union. They meant, they meant the opposite. They meant, they meant destroying the voluntary union and forcing with bloodshed. Now, in his first inaugural address, uh, Lincoln announced to the world that the war would, would be fought over tax collection. There was no income tax at that time. Uh, uh, tariffs accounted for about more than 90% of all federal tax revenue. The southern states uh, outlawed protectionist tariffs in their constitution. The northern states wanted a 50 to 60% average tariff rate. And so they understood that all the trade of the world would go to the southern ports and New York, Boston would be abandoned as far as that goes. There were northern newspapers associated with the Republican Party before the war, many months before the war, calling for the bombardment of Charleston Harbor in, in, the, in New Orleans and in the southern ports because they saw this, this coming. And so in his first inaugural address, uh, Lincoln said at one point, there, will be, uh, there needs to be no invasion or bloodshed in any state. Now, what, what could possibly cause the US government to cause invasion and bloodshed in its, among its own citizens in, a, in an American state? The next sentence, he explains what? The average tariff rate had just been doubled two days earlier. Okay, and they knew the Southerners had seceded, some of them, not all of them yet, had seceded. Virginia was still in the Union, uh, and they had, and they had uh, uh, passed this doubling of the average tariff tax. And he said, it's my duty to collect the duties and imposts, tariffs. And then he said, but beyond that, there will be no invasion of any state. So he literally threatened war, invasion, he used the word bloodshed, and force to describe what's gonna happen if you don't collect that tax. And of course, the, the Southerners didn't intend to keep sending money to Washington, D.C. any more than they intended to send money to London or Paris or, or anywhere. They were, they, they were no longer a part of the U.S. government. And so if you wanna know the cause of the war, that's the cause of the war, right, right there. Uh, if you, and you could also read Jefferson Davis's inaugural address given in Montgomery, Alabama, not too far from here, about an hour down the road. He does not say one word about slavery in, the, in the, that address. And he says, we are, an, uh, we are an agricultural nation. We trade with the whole world. There are people in the North who want to interfere with this and force us to, to uh, withdraw from that. And we're willing to defend ourselves if we, if we are invaded uh, to do that. That's what he said in his inaugural address. And so, and so Lincoln started the war over tax collection. He probably thought it would be a short thing, couple, last maybe a couple of weeks. And that's, you know, that's the, the biggest uh, miscal political miscalculation in American history. He waged war on civilians for four years, killing tens of thousands of them, 
bombing and burning American cities and towns to the ground, uh, rewarding his, and rewarding his plundering, looting, and raping army uh, with promotions like General Sherman. If you read about what happened in the, in the southern states for four years, not just Sherman's march uh, you know, through parts of the South, but for all four years, it was very typical they would get to a town and burn every single house down. I, I moved here fairly in the past, you know, at the beginning of the year from Bluffton, South Carolina, and uh, right next to Hilton Head Island. And there's a little book in the little bookstore there about what happened during the, the Civil War uh, in Bluffton. And the Union Army came in and burned every single private home. And then they did it all throughout the South and every business. And then they st after stealing whatever was stealable, and then, uh, and then just uh, put the people out uh, when, uh, when Atlanta, when uh, in Atlanta, uh, after the Confederate Army had evacuated, uh, there was just women and children and uh, old men uh, there. They spent four days shelling Atlanta. They just, uh, just and, and, and setting fires. So that's that's uh, sort of the sort of thing that happened. Okay, Lincoln support in his first inaugural address, he supported a constitutional amendment that would have enshrined slavery explicitly in the Constitution forever. It was called the Corwin Amendment, and it was named after Congressman Thomas Corwin of Ohio. Uh, but it was really Lincoln's amendment. Doris Kearns Goodwin wrote this thousand-page book called Team of Rivals. And she cites uh, uh, primary resources showing that this was Lincoln's hand. This was Lincoln's work. He instructed William Seward to get this through the Senate, which he did. And it was passed by the Senate and the House. And it was ratified by five states, including Illinois, land of Lincoln. Uh, it ratified this con constitutional amendment that would have prohibited the federal government from ever interfering with slavery. Okay, Now, <clears throat> Lincoln claimed in his inaugural address, he said, I understand that there is an amendment that would uh, do this with slavery. And he said, I think slavery is already constitutional, but I have no objection to making it, in his words, expressed and irrevocable. Well, that was another big fat lie. Who, who could believe that in 1861, an amendment to change the Constitution had passed the House and the Senate to, to prohibit interfering with slavery in 1861, and the state of Illinois ratified the, the amendment, Lincoln's state, and he knew nothing about it. He claimed he nothing, he'd never seen it, never asked anybody to show it to him. He, 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 you know, a big, another big fat lie. And so that's where he was in 1861, declaring war over tax collection. And uh, if you go online and read Lincoln's first inaugural address, I call it the most powerful defense of slavery ever made by an American president. By far, by far, he, you know, an American president who endorsed the constitutional amendment to enshrine slavery explicitly in the Constitution. Okay, he illegally suspended the writ of habeas corpus and mass arrested tens of thousands of northern civilians for merely criticizing him and his war. Uh, uh, and he accused them of treason. Now, the Constitution has a definition of treason. The U.S. Constitution it uses the word only. And then it says, only levying war upon the United States or giving aid and comfort to their enemies, their enemies, in the plural. In those days, the United States was always in the plural in all the founding documents in America, meaning the individual states were united in creating a confederacy of states. Okay, And so levying war against Alabama, Virginia, Louisiana, that's treason under the Constitution. And that, of course, is exactly what Lincoln did. And, but he, re, he redefined treason to mean criticizing me. And so literally tens of thousands of northern uh, uh, people for just saying something, you know, criticizing the war, were, were put in prison without due process. These soldiers would come, come to your house, drag you out, and bring you in prison. So he and his entire government committed treason uh, for doing that. He destroyed the system of federalism that was created by the founders, uh, maybe 90% of it, by eliminating the rights of nullification and secession. Uh, nullification has sort of made a bit of a comeback in the last 20 years in the US. 
But the whole idea behind uh, the right of secession and nullification, according to the founders, was that if the politicians in the nation's capital know they pass an unconstitutional law and the states can nullify the law and just say, we won't enforce it within our boundaries, or they can secede and say, enough is enough, we, we no longer want to be a part of this union, then the politicians in Washington are less likely to pass unconstitutional laws. That was, that was the thinking behind that. But that was uh, swept aside. Another thing that was swept aside by Lincoln's war uh, was the idea that uh, all the branches of government had equal say in what's constitutional. The president had an equal say to the Supreme Court, uh, as, as did the Congress, as did the people of the states. That was the thinking in America before the war. After the war, uh, that would all be determined by five government lawyers with lifetime tenure otherwise known as the, the majority of the U.S. Supreme Court. And the old Jeffersonians had always warned that if the day ever came that the federal government became the sole arbiter of the limits of its own powers, that it would eventually, uh, there, there would be, eventually be no limits to its, to its powers. And he looked, talk about the fox guarding the hen, hen house. Shut down over 300 opposition newspapers in the North, uh, and, and, some, and imprisoned some of the owners and editors of the papers, one of whom was the grandson of Francis Scott Key, the author of The Star-Spangled Banner, who was imprisoned in Fort McHenry in Baltimore, where his grandfather wrote The Star-Spangled Banner. For, uh, and he wrote an editorial criticizing the illegal suspension of the writ of habeas corpus. And for that, he was dragged out of his home in the middle of the night, stuck in a dungeon at uh, Fort McHenry. Uh, he rigged the 1864 election, so they had massive censorship of the telegraphs and the mails and, and uh, the, the shutting down of 300 newspapers, and the elections were, were rigged also. They used different colored ballots for Democrats and Republicans. Soldiers intimidated the Democrat voters. Uh, Democrats who are registered Democrats uh, who were in the army, were left out in the field, whereas uh, the Republicans were, were allowed to be furloughed on election day, that, that sort of thing. So that happened in 1864. Uh, he was a lifelong advocate of what they called colonization. Uh, Lincoln was the, he was the, 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 the uh, leader, the chairman of the Illinois Colonization Society, which used tax dollars to deport the small number of free black people who lived in Illinois at the time, which they did. And then when he became president, he still championed that. He, he had a, a meeting in the White House of some free black men and urged them to lead by example and go to Liberia and Africa, yeah, any, anywhere but America. Uh, and uh, they wisely said, no thanks. <laughs> and, so, but, and so that's what he, and there's a book that was published um, about maybe about five or six years ago now called Colonization After Emancipation by Philip Magnus, who's now the president of the Independent Institute in California, uh, and, and a co-author, Sebastian, that's his name, I forget what his name is, Sebastian something or other. But anyway, colonization after emancipation, they, sh they showed, they went to the British archives and the US National Archives and got documentation that up until his dying day, Lincoln was working with William Seward and counting how many ships it would take to, to deport all the black people out of America. Uh, the ex all the ex-slaves, uh, and, and that was going on. And for, for decades, generations, the his history profession claimed that he had some sort of a magical epiphany in, the, in 1863 where, where he no longer believed in colonization. But there's no, no evidence of that. They just say, well, yeah, this happened. And, uh, but, but these two authors prove beyond all doubt, no, it didn't happen. And he believed that until it literally his dying day. He invoked the first military conscription law of the federal government and ordered the execution of, of deserters. There was some battle, the Battle of Antietam. Uh, on the eve of the Battle of Antietam, there were 90,000 deserters from the Union Army. <laughs> 90, deserters, it was a 180,000 man army and half of it deserted, it just disappeared into the woods uh, you know, on the eve of the battle. And that's where, so they, they had, uh, uh, they started cracking down on that, and so they had uh, firing squads, and the, typically what they would do, is they would stand up uh, the deserter over a, a hole that they had dug, and they would shoot him and push him into the hole and bury him, and they would uh, require all the other soldiers to stand around and watch. 
and this happened on a daily basis once they were, once they were going on to, uh, to enforce military conscription. He very strongly enforced the Fugitive Slave Act during his administration. This was a federal law that required Northerners to uh, uh, hunt down runaway slaves. And, and that, was, that was enforced in Washington, D.C. during the, the Lincoln administration. He ignored the fact that all the rest of the world, including all the northern states, Massachusetts, New York, Illinois, Pennsylvania, ended slavery peacefully. England, France, Spain, the Dutch, the Danes, they all found a way to end slavery peacefully. Only in America was a, a, a war attached to slavery. And even then, it wasn't until two-thirds of the war was over and they had killed maybe a quarter of a million Southerners. And uh, one-fourth of the adult male population of the South was killed during the, the American Civil War. And more than double that number were maimed for life, missing arms, legs, something like that. Uh, in 1870... 75% uh, of the budget of the state of Louisiana went for artificial limbs and, and other states, similar in other states also. Uh, uh, as far as the Emancipation Proclamation goes, uh, when, when I was at, I visited the uh, Lincoln Presidential Museum in Springfield, Illinois once. I was invited to give a talk by the Illinois Libertarian Party. I went on a, on a visit. And they had a very interesting video, they had a beautiful cinematic presentation and they had the face of an ex-slave up there and a voiceover and the voiceover were reading the, the ex-slave's words the ex-slave after the war he knew how to write he wrote about and he said well we heard about this emancipation proclamation but we knew it wasn't real because we didn't we weren't emancipated um, we weren't freed and and, and, the, and which was true I, I was shocked that they would actually have that at the Lincoln Presidential Museum, because the Emancipation Proclamation, specifically in the in the text of it, exempts all only applies to rebel territory, where they had no ability to free anybody, and it specific specifically exempts all the areas of the country where the Union Army was in charge. Every parish in Louisiana where the Union Army was in control at the time was exempted from the by name right in the text of the Emancipation Proclamation, as was the entire state of West Virginia, which was created by the Lincoln Republican Party during the war. And so they could have freed all the slaves in West, West Virginia, uh, but they didn't. They, they, it's right in there. It's right in the text. West, it doesn't get, count in West Virginia. And so, and so the Europeans, of course, all mocked Lincoln for this. And they, there are a lot of famous Americans, too, who who just saw this as uh, phony. And, and Lincoln himself called it a war, a war issue, a war policy. Uh, the only logical reason he get for it is probably he thought it might incite, incite slave rebellions, which it did not. And, uh, and, so, uh, and he, also, he had also said about it that uh, if the South would rejoin the Union, the Emancipation Proclamation would be defunct immediately. It would be, you know, they would just ignore it. Okay, he raised tariffs 10 times, and, uh, and the, by the time he left office and was assassinated, the tariff rate was around 60%. He instituted the first income tax in American history, and the tariffs remained at that level for the next 60 years. Lincoln's wife inherited slaves. He married a, a, a woman who came from a wealthy Kentucky slave plantation-owning family, that was connected to Henry Clay, Lincoln's political idol and mentor, you know, not literally a mentor, but his, you know, uh, uh, philosophically a, a mentor. And she inherited slaves. And, and in those days, uh, the, the woman could not own that property. They became the property of the husband. Lincoln sold the slaves. So he, he sold the slaves. He did not free them. He sold them. Around the same time, Robert E. Lee's wife, who was a descendant of Martha Washington, inherited slaves. And her father, uh, in his will, said they are to be freed, and Robert E. Lee freed them in 1862. So how, who was taught that in school in America, that Robert E. Lee's wife inherited slaves and he set them all free? Abraham Lincoln's wife inherited slaves. He sold them. Okay, and that, that's what, exactly what happened. As a lawyer, he represented slave owners, uh, and he would go into court with manacles, putting on a show, you know, this slave is going to go back to my client. 
uh, but he never, he never represented a runaway slave. Now, the, the death toll of Lincoln's war, uh, for 100 years, historians said it was 620,000. That's more than all American deaths and all other wars combined, World War I, World War II, Vietnam, Korea, all of them. That's just that number. And if you standardize it for today's population, it would be about 6.2 million. But, there's, but in the past five or six years, the forensic historical research has uh, informed us that you know, the number is probably between 750 and 850,000. And, and so if it's at the high number, the 850,000, that would be the equivalent of 8.5 million Americans dying in under, just under four years, uh, being killed basically uh, you know, in a war that takes place right here. And the number of people who were maimed physically and psychologically in that war was more than double the number of deaths. So if you, if you translate that into modern day, that'd be you know, a huge number of people maimed physically and, and psychologically. And so that's why there's a book out by Larry Tagg called uh, uh, America's uh, uh, Most Unpopular President. It's about Lincoln. He's, and during his time, during his lifetime, uh, Larry Tagg, um, the historian, argues that he was by far the most reviled, he used the word reviled, president in American history uh, in his own time. But then after he was assassinated, the Republican Party turned him into a, a deity. Harper's Magazine once had a lithograph, and you can look this up online, it's on the web, there's a, of a, an angel ascending to heaven with a big angel's wings, and beneath the angel is an open tomb, and the head of the angel is Abraham Lincoln. And that, that's the sort of thing that went on. They said that the first biography of Lincoln after his death was written said his mother was the most chaste woman since the Virgin Mary herself. And it said his father was illiterate, but he read the Bible. And so, <laughs> so this kind of stuff. And, and that went on for decades and, and decades. If you're interested in this, there's a book called The Deification of Lincoln that was written in the 1940s that tells the whole story. Okay. I, I could, as you know, I could probably stand up here for another four or five days telling you stories <laughs> like this. Uh, but I'm going to go on to uh, Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson's re-election campaign, when he was, first became president in, in 1913, he won the 1912 election. His re-election campaign slogan was, he kept us out of war. Three months after he was inaugurated, he asked for a declaration of war against Germany. <laughs> Germany wanted peace talks in 1916. The British didn't. And Woodrow Wilson went along with that. The war could have ended right there. 116,000 American men died in that, in that war. So that could have been prevented totally at that point. Of course, the Germans were demonized as, uh, this is long before Hitler, uh, the Germans were demonized as dictatorial you know, monsters. Germany had freedom of press at the time. You could freely criticize the Kaiser, the, the, the head of the uh, German government. They had a broader voting franchise than England did, more rights to vote. They had the rule of law, due process of law. The German Kaiser had less power than Woodrow Wilson did in his position, and I'm going to talk about some of the powers that Wilson uh, latched on to. And yet they were demonized as dictatorial and undemocratic. The aftermath uh, of, of all of this was that the French and the British divided up uh, <clears throat> German colonies and Middle East lands to control the oil in the Middle East. How's that turned out so far? You know, you're carving up the Middle East arbitrarily and creating the, all of these, these countries. Here's a statement. I'm going to read a statement by Wilson. It reminds me of something I heard John McCain say. McCain, the late John McCain, was giving a speech to a veterans group, and he said something almost exactly like this just you know, maybe 10 years ago. When I, when I read this, this statement that I'm going to read to you by Wilson, it reminded me that McCain said almost the exact same thing. Here's, here's Woodrow Wilson saying, there will come some time another struggle, meaning a war, in which not a few hundred thousand fine men from America will have to die, but many millions to accomplish the final freedom of the peoples of the world. 
well, I don't, you know, be some, someday, it's almost like he's wishing there, there will be some war that will involve millions of deaths, millions of deaths, and, uh, and we'll find, but finally the people of the world will be free. Who the hell does he think he was? You know, you know here's Woodrow Wilson, here's God right here. That's, that's the way he was, uh, when you read this, this kind of stuff. Yeah, John McCain, the same, for that, as far as that goes. And of course, World War I and the Versailles Treaty led to Hitler, Stalin, Lenin, and all that. Woodrow Wilson paid the provisional government of Russia, you know, at the, around the time of the Russian, just before the revolution, to enter the war, to enter World War I. 400,000 Russians died. 116,000 Americans, but 400,000 Russians died after uh, Wilson paid them to enter the war. The only anti-war political organization in Russia at the time were the Bolsheviks. So the Russian people supported the Bolsheviks because the people never won war. And whether it's the Russian people or the American people or any other people, it's always the state that wants wars. And so Vladimir Lenin himself once said this, quote, our revolution was born of the war. That it was the Bolsheviks were the anti-war party. And, he, he, and Lenin himself said that we, we probably wouldn't have gained power had it not been in for this. In pursuit of corporate welfare, this is a, maybe this will be another chapter in one of Patrick's cronyism books. Uh, in pursuit of corporate welfare, Wilson ordered the invasion of Mexico 11 times. <laughs> 11 times. Nicaragua, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Cuba, Panama, all were invaded by, uh, by the orders of, of Woodrow Wilson. He was a madman. Every one of you, at some point, if you haven't already, should read an essay called War is a Racket by Smedley Butler. He was a general in the United States Marine Corps, early 20th century. He's said to be the most highly decorated Marine Corps officer in history. And, he, and it's online. You can read War is a Racket. And I want to read you one famous paragraph from War is a Racket by Smedley Butler, General Smedley Butler. He said, I spent 33 years and four months in active military service, and during that period, I spent most of my time as a high-class muscle man for big business, for Wall Street and the bankers. In short, I was a racketeer, a gangster for capitalism. Not crony, it should be crony capitalism, it's not, not capitalism. I helped make Mexico and especially Tampico safe for American oil interests. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National Citibank boys to collect revenues in. I helped in the raping of half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the international banking house of Brown Brothers. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interests. I helped make Honduras right for the American fruit companies in 1903. In China, I helped to see to it that Standard Oil went on its way unmolested, and on and on and on. And so that's, that's what was going on. And this, this was about the same period of history. He was a Marine Corps general in the early 20th century, in, in the Woodrow Wilson's day. His new freedom agenda involved creation of the Fed, the income tax, the Clayton Antitrust Act, alcohol prohibition, and the 17th Amendment that uh, created the direct election of senators. Before that, before, before the direct election of senators, which started in 1913, senator, U.S. senators were appointed by legislatures. So, for example, if a senator said, uh, back from Alabama said, I'm against the Fed, I don't, I'm going to vote, I don't want us to create the Fed. At this time, I'm going to, if I go to Washington, I'm going to vote no. And then if he goes to Washington and he votes yes, he could have been fired on the spot. And they sent a new senator. But the way it is now, if you just got elected, you have five and a half years to collect uh, campaign contributions from the banking industry. And so you're never going to leave Washington. You'll never leave the Senate. You're going to be there forever. In fact, if you, if you were to Google... Uh, Congressional incumbent re-election rates in the U.S., you'll find a chart that says for about the past 50 years, the re-election rate in the House of Representatives is about 95%, and it's maybe 90, 88, or 90% in the Senate. So once you're there, it's pretty easy to be there until you, until you 
collapse and you know you know and just croak in your in your in your, in your, off, in your office. Uh, Wilson uh, uh, and, and alcohol prohibition eventually came after it was after Wilson 1920. Wilson was gone, but that was part of his agenda, and it lasted 13 years. He censored all telephone and telegraphs and blocked the mail from, from anti-war papers. If you were, if you were an, if the paper editorialized against the war, you, and the papers were still being widely delivered by mail at that time. He imprisoned thousands for opposing the war, just like Lincoln. He responded to, there was Ku Klux Klan violence in New Jersey and Ohio and the Midwest. Not Alabama and Louisiana, New Jersey, Ohio, and the Midwest. Ku Klux Klan violence. He had the FBI get involved to spy on who? The black people in New Jersey and in Ohio. And the people who are being targeted by the Ku Klux Klan. That's what Woodrow Wilson did. His attorney general, Thomas Gregory, sent thugs into private homes to go through their mail to see if they had received letters or were writing letters to somebody that expressed anti-war sentiments. Could you imagine that, coming into your house? Well, I could. I, I saw the Mar-a-Lago raid on TV. I, I, I can imagine that. Yeah. He resegregated the military, like I said. And he claimed that his war was the war to make the world safe for democracy, world de for world democracy. And so, you know, if you're, a, if you're an anti-war protester, you're in, what are you in favor of, world dictatorship? Uh, so, yeah, so that's, uh, so if you're wondering where this stuff is, where the, the, uh, the Democrat Party of today keeps calling Trump Hitler uh, and, and, a, and a threat to democracy, this is old stuff. This is, Woodrow Wilson was, and his people were saying this you know, more than 100 years ago, okay. Uh, and these people who were uh, draft protesters and war protesters had some long prison sentences. Eugene Debs was the Socialist Party uh, candidate for president. He was given a 10-year prison sentence for simply making a public speech uh, opposing the war. So, so that's Woodrow. That's, <laughs> second, that's, that's the second part of the axis of evil. Uh, the third one, the third one, a uh, uh, delightful character uh, I like to talk about this evening. <laughs> uh, I'm going to write a book someday about good guys in politics. The only problem is just going to be about Ron Paul. <laughs> that's, 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 you know, it won't be a very long book, you know. It, um, um. Okay, FDR was a proud fascist on economic policy. The first New Deal involved the National Industrial Recovery Act and the Agricultural Adjustment Act. And the essence of both of them was try to create government-enforced cartels in manufacturing and agriculture. That's a good idea. When, when you're in a depression, let's restrict production. Let's, let's find out how we can re reduce production in every way possible. And the NRA did that. They had price codes. And it made it illegal. Price cutting was illegal. They had price code police swarming around cities. There were people who went to jail for, for, for uh, sewing a man's pants for a, a lower price than what the government said you should use. Because the idea was they had this very sophisticated economic model uh, apparently given to them by one of those MIT mathematical economists that said uh, the depression was caused by low prices Therefore, if we force prices up, the depression will end. That's my theory, anyway. About how, but that's basically what they said. They thought if we could, pour, if we could force prices up, we'll end the Great Depression. And, that's, uh, and, and of course, that didn't, that didn't work. It just made the Great Depression worse. And these were both ruled unconstitutional in 1935, the NRA and the NIRA and the AAA. Yeah, but they they were they recreated the same a lot of the same programs under a different name. They just gave them different names, and and, and the, for example, they, they started the business of pay of uh, forcing farmers or bribing them, paying them to grow fewer crops and to raise less livestock to push up the price of livestock and the price of of food. Okay, and they just called it soil conservation programs. They didn't call it. They didn't call it rip off the consumer program, which is what it was. 
they made unemployment very much worse with social security taxes, unemployment insurance taxes, minimum wage laws, uh, laws that empowered unions to raise taxes, raise uh, wages even more. So the last thing you want to do in a deep depression is make it more expensive to hire labor. If anything, it's a, you should make it, uh, you want it to be less expensive, at least you have a job. But they, so they priced even more people out of work by doing this. There's, there's a great book by our friends uh, Richard Vetter and Lowell Galloway called Out of Work uh, that talks about this. And they, they think it, ca it caused, they conclude that it, all of this caused the Great Depression to be uh, longer, maybe by six or seven years than necessary and much uh, more severe as a result. And even the mainstream of the economics profession finally came around to this about 10 or 12 years ago. There was an article in the journal of Political Economy by a man named Ohanian. He was, he's a professor at uh, UCLA who uh, did a very, very fanciful game theoretic exposition of this in the, and concluded that uh, he must have thought, you know, I've been teaching principles of economics and we teach that uh, cartels and monopolies uh, restrict production. And if they restrict production, maybe they, maybe they also restrict employment too, if they do that. And, and the, it came to his realization as the editor of the American Economic Review, by the way, that, well, maybe this uh, caused unemployment to be worse and not better. And so he did some statistical analysis also. And, and there have been others like that, the, saying the same thing the Austrians said from the very beginning of this. <clears throat> Another book I would recommend if you're interested in uh, World War II history, Day of Deceit by Robert Stinnett. The Japanese code had been broken before Pearl Harbor, and the Japanese did not maintain radio silence as they approached Pearl Harbor. Roosevelt knew it all. He knew the Japanese were coming to Pearl Harbor because he manipulated them into coming by, by cutting off their oil supply. And, and Robert Stinnett, is a war, who is a World War II veteran, and he became a journalist in California after the war, uh, proves this in his book, Day of Deceit. And so, and, and that, that might be why the, uh, you know, Pearl Harbor was blamed on the two naval commanders for generations, and uh, the Congress finally exonerated them just a few years ago. I don't know if it's because of this. I have no idea why they did that, but they did do it. That and so they were given the blame for not knowing, but they the information was not shared with them. So so Roosevelt unequivocally knew that the Japanese were because he wanted America to enter war, enter the war. Uh, the internment of Japanese, 120,000 Japanese Americans, some of whom were third generation, were rounded up, forced to sell all their property, and put in concentration camps. And they were called concentration camps. They weren't called reservations like the Indians. They did this to the Indians after the Civil War. Uh, and the Supreme Court actually ruled, even though you know the Constitution says you, you cannot deny people the economic liberties without due process, well, the Japanese Americans were not given any due process. So they were rounded up and thrown in concentration camps. And the Supreme Court said, that's OK. OK, we'll look the other way on this one. And it's, it's constitutional. They ruled it unconstitutional. Okay. Attacks on civil liberties were just as severe as under Lincoln. Uh, he got friends in the Senate, that is, political friends in the Senate, to investigate opponents of the New Deal. FDR did. There was this, one of the senators, Hugo Black, who he would who uh, was later appointed to the Supreme Court. Our friend Brian McClanahan calls Hugo Black FDR's favorite Ku Klux Klansman, because he was he was a he was a proud Ku Klux Klansman and chum of uh, Franklin Roosevelt, he demanded the release of millions of private telegrams to Republicans in the Congress. And so all the donors to these Republicans were horrified that their names would be out in the public and, and, uh, and all this, especially, you know, they're, they're against the war, they're unpatriotic, and it would ruin their business. And so it was an, an act of intimidation, and he used uh, uh, FDR's favorite uh, KKK guy, Hugo Black, to, to do that. There was something called the National Committee to Uphold Constitutional Government. How could you disagree with that? Proposed a bill to outlaw false news about government <laughs> with, with government determining what's false. 
Roosevelt used the Federal Communications Commission to turn the entire radio industry into FDR monkeys, very much like today's television news are Democrat Party monkeys, and, 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 and except for Fox and maybe one or two others, something like that. And so this is nothing new either. You know, the fake news by the media, that's nothing new. He used the entire federal communications. So you, you know, you, if, if you were to criticize FDR, you're going to lose your license to do business. Okay? The Justice Department charged anti-war activists with sedition, meaning you're going to prison if you're, if you're convicted of sedition. Okay. Newspapers critical of the war were denied use of the Postal Service, as they were during the Lincoln regime uh, also. Okay, so that's, uh, that's pretty much uh, what I'm going to say for now. Again, I could probably talk a lot more about FDR, but I would recommend you read my book, How Capitalism Saved America. I have a whole chapter on, uh, <laughs> on how, how the New Deal made the Great Depression worse, if you want to book up a little more. And the, the Vetter Galloway book is, is excellent. So that's my story about the axis of evil, three, America's three worst presidents, uh, and up until a few years ago, uh, we were all supposed to be taught that these were the three best presidents uh, of all. And it makes me think that uh, they judge, the history professors seem to judge uh, best in terms of how many Americans die when you're in office. You know, Lincoln, 850,000. Wilson, 116,000. World War II, you know, Roosevelt, you know, uh, all of that. And so if you, if you cause a lot of Americans to die and raise a lot of taxes and just ignore the Constitution, you're our guy, says the, the American history profession. But like I said at the beginning, if you study Austrian economics, you see through the economic hocus pocus. And Lincoln, by the way, uh, his, his economic policies for 25 years before becoming president involved three things, protectionist tariffs, corporate welfare for the railroad industry and the road building and canal building companies and a national bank. Bring back the Fed. You know, the, early, the, the, the original Fed was called the Bank of the United States. And there's a book uh, by Michael Holt on the history of the Whig Party. It's probably up here somewhere. And he, and he says, in there, and, and Lincoln was a Whig for 25 years before the, he became a Republican. And, uh, and Michael Holt, who's a professor at the University of Virginia, said that... Uh, not the university where I went to school. This is UVA. But he said that no, no one in the Whig Party was a more vociferous proponent of bringing back a national bank than Abraham Lincoln. You know, all, he, he, he campaigned for all the Whig politicians over and over again when they, went, when they were out campaigning to bring back the bank. And he didn't succeed in doing that, but they did nationalize the money supply with the National Currency Acts and the Legal Tender Acts during his, uh, during his administration. So, so that's, uh, and that was, of course, the, sort of the, there was an explosion of crony capitalism that, had, that commenced with the uh, subsidies to the railroads. And that led, that led to a great scandal in, during the Grant administration, as far as that goes. Okay, um, I think that's about all I'm going to have to say now. Uh, we're not going to do Q&A tonight, are we, though? Uh, I don't think so. Okay, the answer, no. It's been a long day for everybody, but you're young. You can handle it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.